primo relatore che abbiamo tra noi è il dottor Jürg Schlup, che è presidente della Federazione dei Medici Svizzeri, che è un medico internista generale, che è anche però detentore di un master in business administration presso l'Università di San Gallo, che ha svolto la sua attività di medico di base fino al 2012, è stato presidente della Associazione Svizzera dei Medici Assistenti e Capoclinica ed è, come ho detto prima, attualmente presidente della FMH. Il titolo della sua conferenza sarà Il dovere primario di un medico è di fare la scelta migliore per il proprio paziente. Ringrazio il dottor Schlup e gli do la parola. Grazie. Grazie consiglio di Stato Beltramelli. Eh, la sua presenza è un grande onore per noi e il simposio è un importante segnale per questo Choosing Wisely subject. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I change to English because uh, il mio italiano non è troppo bello. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here in Lugano and to see that so many health professionals are interested in the topic of wise medicine and smarter medicine, smarter choices. When we think about what the primary duty of a doctor might be, I guess to most of us the answer is quite clear. The primary duty of a doctor is the best choice for his patient. This duty was already expressed approximately 2,000 years ago in the Hippocratic Oath with the statement, my visit shall be for the convenience and advantage of the patient. And similarly, the Declaration of Geneva put forward by World Medical Association includes the sentence, the health of my patient will be my first consideration. So why do we have to talk about small, smarter medicine? choosing wisely. Why should a physician take decisions that are not for the advantage of his or her patient? I read an interesting article in the British Medical Journal where the authors stated that, as you can see here, unbalanced, unbalanced decision-making results from a culture where the onus is on doctors to do something at each consultation. The article lists some specific reason for unbal un unbalanced decision-making which can be assigned to two groups. First group, we find conflict of interest, such as commercial conflict of interest in terms of financial advantages for the physician himself or th third parties. Or defensive medicine, this means the intention of a physician to avoid liab liability cases. Second group, We find ignorance, lack of information, reasons why a physician might to not be able to identify the best choice or to implement it. These reasons are the biased reporting in medical journals, the pressure by patients, and also our lack of understanding of health statistics and risk. I will elaborate on these points in the following. If we look at economic conflict of interests more in detail, one important topic are bonuses as an element of physicians' incomes. As a study conducted on behalf of the Swiss Medical Association showed contractual agreements on targets and bonuses are quite common in Swiss hospitals. And these bonuses account for a considerable part of the income. In chief physicians and their deputies, on average, 19% of their income depends on specific targets. In senior consultants, 
is even 25% of their income. And in consultants, we found a mean of 8% after all. One result of a study of Professor Nicola Billerandorno shows, and that's this slide, I save a bit time, in, she works, Professor Biller Andorno works in Zurich, and this uh, result shows how physicians in hospital charge their professional situation under economic pressure. They were asked how they personally would trade the economic interest of the hospital against the patient's interest and well-being. The physician found, on average, that in an ideal situation, in physician's point of view, the balance of interest between the hospital side, here given a zero, and the patient's side, here given a 10, would be 7.7. .7. However, when they were asked how the balance is in their real life current job, they reported, on average, a value of 5.5. So physicians are forced to weigh patients' interests in Switzerland less in every day's work than they would like to. However, the economic conflicts of interests are only a small part of the picture. If you look this list, including the five measures that were published in 2014 with, uh, the, by the Swiss Association of Internal Medicine in order to reduce unnecessary treatments, you can see that regarding these interventions, economic pressure and interest are not very likely to play a role. When I think about what drives physicians to perform useless interventions, I rather assume motives such as defensive medicine, patient pressure, simply the wish to do something, to the, the lack of statistical knowledge, or simply habits and ignorance. Defensive medicine. In simple words, this term describes that physicians sometimes depart from normal medical practice as a safeguard for litig litigation. This can mean the avoidance of risky procedures, but what is more interesting here is over-treatment. Because of the fear of a lawsuit, with all its personal and reputational consequences. This phenomenon is not particular to the US, but is also observable in Switzerland. Beside the fact that uh, there might be legal reasons to rather act than wait, it is also a human threat to behave in that way. I would like to tell you an example which I found in a book by Rolf de Belli. He calls it the action bias. He refers to a study that analyzed hundreds of penalty situations in soccer. The player who has to convert a penalty kicks in one third of cases to the left, in the middle, or to the right. But what does the keeper? In approximately 50% of cases, he jumps to the left, and the other 50%, he jumps to the right. Never, never he kept staying in the middle. Why? The belly says, because he does not want to stand like an idiot, in the middle of the goal while he misses the ball at the right or at the left. So we do not tend to honor people that made the right things and right decisions by waiting. 
Another reason why we rather act than wait is that the information provided to us is biased and thus no adequate biases basis for decision making. In this picture you can see the way of a scientific article before it is published. At each station the probability for a study with positive results has a higher chance to reach the patient. Besides the fact that the reporting in medical journals is biased, it is unfortunately true that many physicians have difficulties to interrupt their results. Sorry, to interpret, to interpret their results, uh, especially when physicians have to counsel their patients and have to communicate complex issues such as harm-benefit balances to their patients. It is indispensable that physicians themselves feel confident to handle concepts such as positive and negative predictive values. Another challenge is that even when physicians and patients understand the probabilities, it is highly individual how they are judged. A study published recently in the British Medical Journal asked people from a general population sample how much over detection they accept in the, in the following scenari scenarios. Across all scenarios, the median of accepted over detection and treatment ranged between 10 to 30 percent. I think these numbers show that acceptance of overdetection is highly variable and that some patients might have a tendency to accept inappropriately high side effects in order to reduce the probability to die from cancer. This last consideration takes me back to the importance of counseling and shared decision making. As you all knew or know, shared decision making is not only less profitable compared to simply applying diverse tests and treatments, above all it is time intensive and unfortunately Time is a limited resource in everyday clinical life. Conclusions. What we have to improve in our daily practice when we want to facilitate the best choice for the patient, that is, as you can see here, the best match between what is known about the benefits and harms of each intervention and the goals and preferences of each patient. We need to continuously improve conditions and fees and we need to fight the practice of bonuses. We need to support communication and shared decision making. We can do it by fi financial incentives, but also by raising awareness and teaching. Third, furthermore, we need to increase knowledge, for example, in health statistics, but also regarding our, our own cognitive biases, such as the action bias. Four, rising awareness for the whole topic of choosing wisely is important not only among physicians but also among patients. Especially for patients the choosing wisely list are helpful however the future we should develop more information with and for patients that explain why less can sometimes be more. 
And last but not least, we need to spread information regarding liability risk in order to free physicians from unnecessary fears and to sensitize the public regarding the drawbacks of US American standards. So I wish you an interesting conference and exciting discussions, and I thank you very much for your attention.